Welcome to Authors Alcove. I am your host, Agnes Wolf. Today I have Rob Bignell. He has published over 55 books, helped more than 300 writers achieve their publishing dreams, and is now the author of the Storytelling 101 Quick Read series, which answers common questions about writing, self-publishing, and marketing. There are a total of 12, and four of them has hit the number one spot on various Amazon new release bestsellers, although I believe five of them are relatively new, have just come out in the last Mm -hmm. couple weeks. Right, yep. So welcome, Rob. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Um, Could you just share a little bit about yourself and your background in the writing industry? Sure, yeah. Well, I've been writing stories since, gosh, since second grade (laughs) and that, and got my first piece published in fifth grade, but I spent most of my years actually in journalism, working as a reporter, as an as an editor. And then uh, in about 2008, when the Great Recession set in and the journalism industry was gutted by that, um, I decided that I would go and do freelance editing. And so I started chasing down lots of businesses. I was living in Los Angeles at that time. and. Um, and was having lots of success with that. But um, I started getting lots of inquiries as, you know, a couple of years later, as soon as uh, Amazon came out with Kindle, uh, it's Kindle ebook and Create Space. Um, and people started asking me, um, hey, do you edit books as well? Um, you know, and suddenly I found that I was getting more book editing jobs and it was easier to get those than it was to chase down companies for, you know, short term, five week semi-contracts to to edit their business materials and so on. So I just made the jump in 2011 and switched and I haven't looked back since then. So um, I actually published my first book then the following year in 2012 and I uh, have been doing pretty steadily about five to six books a year since then. Wow, that's impressive. Yeah. What caused you to decide to make the series? So I get a lot of the same questions all the time from clients and um, I've actually got like, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 pages of just stock answers I give people because they're asking the same question and you know, rather than retype it all the time, right? I do that. I, I kind of did that and I like to read lots of other books that have come out about writing, self-publishing and marketing, just sort of stay on top of it as an editor myself to see what's new. Um, but the one thing I found about most of those books is uh, they're full of fluff and they don't really say a lot. You know, the first five chapters are trying to convince you about, you know, why you should show and not tell. But obviously, if you bought the book already, you've decided you don't want to write, tell, you want to show. So let's just cut to the chase and give me the information I need on how not to tell and how to show instead. And and I found this was across the board, especially in the books about marketing and the books about self-publishing, that, that process itself. So. I decided I would take um, a lot of my articles and blogs that I've written over the past 12, 13 years now about writing, self-publishing and marketing, and take some of those stock answers and try to assemble in a really quick, easy to read format. Each of the books are about 10,000 words long, a little less maybe um, in a few cases. And you should be able to read it in about an hour to 90 minutes tops. And they're broken up in really quick, short articles. So it's easy to find information specific to your problem that you may be having. You know, when you're self-publishing and you're uploading stuff to Kindle, you know, direct publishing, for example, and then out of the blue, they ask you this question, you know, about categories and you're like, what? You know, as a new author, you may not have ever even thought about that. It will be separated out. There's a section on just categories and then the next section that they go to, which is about keywords, for example. And so we'll focus on keywords and that. So when you're reading the book, you can go right to that section, get your question answered and and move on. And then again, no fluff in it. The introduction is about the only fluff. And that's about two or three paragraphs saying, hey, this is what this book's about. Well, hopefully if you read the blurb, you already knew. But beyond that, it's direct, useful information that you can use. Because you can get them right now on, at least right right now, Kindle Unlimited for free, if you have Kindle Unlimited. And so I took about four of them and I kind of scanned them Mm -hmm. and one of them I've actually read and they are really good to the point, very easy to scan and very easy to get your questions answered. There's a few I'm like, okay, I'm gonna need these in the future. Not right now, (laughs) but I need them in the future. There are currently 12 titles in the series. Can you share the topics that they cover? 
the the first three or four are all dealing with writing so there's like how to devise your plot i think that's one of the most common questions i see like on, in various facebook groups um, for example from aspiring writers is i've got this great premise but how do i put together that story so that kind of covers that how to plot it i get a lot of dialogue questions or i see a lot of dialogue errors when i'm editing so there's a separate book on just how to write really crisp and engaging dialogue there's a um a set of books on self-publishing of six of them specifically a set of three deal with ebooks a set of three deal with paperbacks for kindle direct publishing um, the first one is how to format your book how to design your cover and then how to upload it here and then the uh, next one that we have after that is on uh, marketing your book and so the most basic thing you can do with marketing is set up an author's platform and then from there set up your author's website which is part of your platform and then um, how to do book readings for example and uh, book signings so that would be a third book so these are sort of like the most basic writing questions the most basic self publishing books and the most essential marketing things that you need but i've got plenty of other books in the series plan uh, primarily in writing since that's what i really focus on as an editor i really don't help clients market books uh, per se just you know toss out suggestions at them and saying hey this is what worked for me or this is what worked for other clients so. awesome so one of the titles that i actually have fully read is devise your stories plot oh and, yeah yeah and you mentioned that there are five traditional <laughs> elements of a plot um yep. what are they and are they all required for all genres they are actually so there's lots of different approaches you can use to plotting your book you could use Aristotle's traditional you know act one act two act three screenwriting has a little different approach uh, they use the same act one act two act three but uh, based on whether it's television for example each act has to be a, a certain length like it's usually one page per minute and so if act one is eight minutes then that's eight minutes showing, then there's a commercial break, then act two has to be a minute. So you can approach stories like that. But all of those stories actually contain five elements that are mentioned here. So the first thing you do with your story is you have what we call the inciting incident. And this is where you present the story's central problem, the protagonist, and you probably establish the setting as well. Um, obviously in novels, the setting changes and shifts, but you have to establish your, your base setting where you're at. And then the bulk of the story is the second element, which is the rising action. And here it's sort of kind of like climbing a mountain. It's like you're going along and you hit this bump and then you real that's the inciting incident. And then you realize to solve this problem, you got to get up over this mountain, right? And so the rising action is that protagonist trying to get up the mountain and they'll face setbacks. They might get a little bit closer, but not solve the problem. They may uh, totally fail and actually help the protate or the uh, antagonist rather make it more likely that the antagonist will succeed. And that's the bulk of your story. And usually that consists of uh, three different scenes as a minimum in a short story and in a novel, probably, you know, several more, maybe eight to 15, depending on what you're writing. And then, of course, you hit the peak of the mountain, which is the climax, and that's sort of your penultimate scene. It's where the antagonist and the protagonist face off, or the protagonist, if you don't have a villain in your story, the protagonist actually resolves the problem and overcomes it. And then, of course, you descend the mountain, and the descent of the mountain is usually very quick in a novel, maybe just a chapter or even less um, in a short story. It could even just be a couple of sentences long in a screenplay like a TV show. It's usually the last minute or two of the show. Um, and what happens in, in that ending, it's called the falling action and then the denouement. It's a French term. You sort of tie up loose ends to your story so while during the rising action maybe something was kind of left unresolved and you know they're figuring out what's going on and usually if there's a romance subplot that's the point where the guy and the girl or the two guys or the two girls get together and and they realize they're in deep love with one another right and that's sort of the uh, payoff for the protagonist to your main character of your story the protagonist or the main character 
when they're solving a problem in a story, there has to be a reason, a motivation for them to do so. And then after they've done that, achieved that goal of solving the problem, there should be some kind of a payoff for them. It could be as simple as uh, Luke Skywalker getting a medal at the end of the movie, right? Like, hey, good job, Luke, you saved the day. Everybody views him as a hero. So that's his payoff that he gets. And so you cover that really quickly, that in the loose ends in just say a couple of paragraphs or a final chapter of your story. So those are sort of the five traditional parts. Um, it's very traditional to teach those five parts in academia and, and literature. So when you began the book, you mentioned that the inciting incident, you need to create a great narrative hook. What mm -hmm. are some secrets of doing that well? Wow, yeah, and that's gonna be a future book. Actually, it's oh, one good. of the books which is out, believe it or not, yeah, which is uh, the second book you'll have to read in the collection, which is um, your story's first page. What should you do with your first 250 words of your story? And so, so a great narrative hook has some kind of interesting twist to it that makes you wanna read further. And usually you're presenting some kind of a situation where you, you wanna read on because you're not quite certain what this character means by that. I mean, you understand what the person is saying in a line or in a sentence, but you're kind of wondering a little more deeply about, well, where's this guy going with this thought? You know, I always think of the uh, famous opening line from Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice as the perfect example of a great narrative hook. You know, a wealthy man must be in need of a wife. And then you're like, what? What's going on here? And then you're wondering, like, well, where's she going with this? And so you want to continue reading on. A lot of the great narrative hooks I use in the story come from science fiction or fantasy because they science fiction in particular has to really use a strong narrative hook to draw you in you can't just say it was a, a pleasant day on the space station yeah, everything was going great so you're like well who cares why read but if you say something like the great eye floated in the sky which is a ray bradbury line you're kind of like what is what's this eye what's it doing in the sky you know what does he mean and then later we learn it's a satellite is what he's talking about is in the sky or uh, another one that uh, is one of my favorites is uh, a george orwell line from 1984 and he goes, it was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. No clocks strike 13, right? And so you're like, what does that mean? And 13, of course, is such a, you know, it's superstitious sort of number, and it's like a bad omen. So you're like, wow, it's this cold, rainy, miserable day, and, and there's this bad omen on the horizon. And so that keeps you reading, because you're like, okay, why are they striking 13? What's going to happen next? What's the omen? So that's sort of what the narrative hook is about. There are plenty of stories that use real basic, you know, kind of lines. But I think a lot of those are, are more genre works like mysteries or romances, for example, where they're trying in a romance, maybe trying to set the mood or in a uh, a mystery, especially if it's a series where you kind of, you know, you just want to read it because you want to see how the crime's going to be solved. So, so sometimes you may not see a great narrative hook in, in some of those genres, but. One of the things you mentioned is that is actually very important in a story is to not start at the beginning, to start in the middle. What do you mean by right. that? And how do you yeah, do it effectively? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So let's take that space station story that we have. It could be a Western fort, or it could be a garrison out on the Roman frontier back in ancient uh, times. What we mean by that is rather than start with, it was a pleasant day at the space station, and then all of a sudden uh, the alarm klaxons go off and people start rushing to their stations, wondering what's going on. And, and then they look up the uh, portal windows and see that this you know, gigantic alien ship that's twice their size is approaching. Instead, start it with them staring out the window looking at the spaceship approaching them or at the western fort um, instead of starting with you know they're all manning their, their post and you know it's just a nice clear blue day sky and then all of a sudden an arrow comes zinging in from from somewhere start them with the arrows already zinged in and they're in this middle of this battle or they're trying to figure out where it was shot from but you can do the same thing in any genre like that so the reason why you want to start in the middle is if you start sort of where the story really begins you're going to give a lot of backstory or a lot of exposition and in 
giving that exposition you're actually going to kind of bore the reader right because it's not very interesting to say you know it was a clear blue sunny day out on the german frontier and you know the garrison legion soldiers were just kind of walking the walls start right ahead with the action you know so like a lot of mysteries will do that by starting with the detective um or the person who solves the crime there at the murder scene the bodies have been murdered already you know and and go from there or if you start with a romance um story you might have the main character having already moved away from a bad relationship and so they're starting out on their own again and they moved off somewhere to resettle so rather than start with them you know leaving in the car this bad relationship go ahead and start with it with them in this new setting where they're restarting their life because that's the start of your actual story so one of the things that you also said was that the conflict is the heart of the story when should that be brought up when should the uh, reader start to notice that there is a conflict yeah within the first 250 words you you should know what the conflict of your story is one thing i've noticed uh, like i go through facebook groups a lot and, and offer advice to, to a lot of aspiring writers and try to develop a relationship right with them and when they come up with a great story premise the one thing they're missing is an overarching conflict that sets your story in motion right so you need some kind of conflict that starts the story and we know your story is ended when that conflict has been resolved now that doesn't mean you won't have other conflicts in the story you'll have tons of other conflicts but they'll just be parts of the scene they might be an inner conflict that is part of a character arc uh, you know kind of weaved into the main plot line but there should be as part of your story a reason for it to even be or to exist so if you take like a, a fantasy story like um the lord of the rings series for example you know the whole goal is if we don't you know destroy this ring bad things will happen we know what the conflict is and we know that there's going to be tons of little mini conflicts along the way as they try to to get the ring or destroy it and what type of conflict common types of conflict are there for different genres sure. yeah so i list five in the book but academics will list other ones and even other authors and editors will all get together and argue well there's really six or there's seven or you know this one but the the four basic ones and then I'll, I'll give you two other ones of which i put one in the book one definitely is is man versus man that's the most obvious and when i say man it could be woman versus woman woman versus man man versus woman i'm just using man in a very generic sense right to mean all a individual person so you can have man versus man one person against another person in conflict with each other right it's like a presidential election it's joe biden versus donald trump it's right barack obama versus mitt romney so man versus man conflict and then of course you can have man versus society in which an individual person entirely disagrees with some of the values of society or some specific value in it and then then is at odds with that society and has to kind of work their way through it that would be something like catcher in the rye for example by uh, jd salinger or it might even be some of the austin novels in which we're questioning the sort of the english values and mores of the day on what are the roles of women the uh, other ones then that you would have would uh, be man versus nature um, a good example of that is jack london's to build a fire in which this guy's in the arctic with his dog and it's freezing and he decides he'll he'll try to build this fire out in the middle of the prairie or the plains of pretty good short story so man versus nature conflict and um, then in addition to that you could have man versus god or the gods this is probably more common in you know ancient literature right where people are disagreeing with the gods and and that but it does exist today and in, in a lot of spirituality or christian fiction in which people are questioning beliefs uh, of religion often those are more you know man versus society it's like the values religious values of society versus a person arguing with god of course you could have man versus himself which is an inner conflict and um, i recommend that you have that of all the, all the conflicts that should be one of the conflicts in your story and one of the driving conflicts in your story and usually you know a man versus himself it's a person can't quite decide where they stand on an issue or value or they have some kind of an inner flaw that they need to overcome so the inner flaw is the easy one it could be something as simple as 
Indiana Jones is afraid of snakes. And um, in order for him to get to this one treasure, he has to pass through a tunnel full of snakes, right? That So how is he going to deal with that? Well, it's kind of a man versus nature, right? Man versus versus snakes, but it's really man versus himself. How does he come up with the inner courage to do that? Some novels, really great novels of all time, great plays, you know, from Hamlet to a lot of the modern fiction stories that we have, uh, like some Steinbeck's work, for example, or Fitzgerald's work, um, are all dealing with that inner conflict. How do I overcome it? Um, one other, which I didn't include in the book, though, I, though I'm slowly kind of believing is probably a conflict we should have include and maybe in future editions i'll modify the book but that would be man versus machine traditionally man versus machine has a, been a man versus society conflict um for example the john henry fable in which you know john henry's a steel driving man and then they invent this machine that can drive steel faster than a man can and so john henry's going to lose his job and and so he challenges the machine to a race and beats the machine right but that's a man versus society conflict because it's society's values are we need to progress we need to have new technology and that makes our lives better and so that's sort of how that's been framed but i think in a lot of science fiction today and we're starting to see it in more literary works as well we're seeing with the advent of ai artificial intelligence now part of our everyday lives right it uh, it is a man versus machine conflict that's going on it's still sort of the realm of science fiction but i think increasingly so it's going to be just part of regular everyday literature and uh, go into all of our different genres in the next 10 to 15 years so in devise the story's plot we have only covered just the intro and you go into right. the rising action the climax and then even how to have the falling action and completely tie up all the loose ends but i do want to ask one more question about sure. the introduction part the first 250 words what are some common pitfalls or problems that people run into sure absolutely yeah the biggest thing i see is exposition starting they give the backstory first there's sort of this belief i think among authors that they've come up with this great backstory and that if they don't tell it to readers readers won't know what's going on but actually the thrill of the story is not necessarily knowing what's going on knowing what to hide and and what to keep out of the brain of the reader and you'll eventually reveal that backstory by weaving bits and pieces of it into your story into the the actual dramatic action of your story so if you have a great backstory save it there are always exceptions to every rule of course and and the one great exception is probably in science fiction or fantasy where people will start with an introduction or a prologue they'll call it and they'll tell the backstory dune for example does this and they've got like 16 or eight pages i think it is of explaining here's the planet we're on and sort of the whole backstory and fantasy stories will do that with well here's the legend but in, in a lot of those cases while it reads like an encyclopedia entry it's really Really fascinating stuff but once you start chapter one no more exposition where you know and a lot of people will skip the prologue anyways and jump right to chapter one so definitely get rid of the the exposition that you have in your story the other issues that you can have are just not introducing elements of your story that you need to know right away the probably the second biggest problem is that central conflict i usually see this with writers who don't plan out their stories in advance now, i'm perfectly okay with pantsy because I, I think most writers do both you know they'll they're outlining if not on paper in their head while they're doing it and but part of the creativity process is actually just coming up with it right there on the spot and that's that's one of the great thrills of writing so i think you know people don't just outline and don't just pants i think they do a combination although some lean one way more than the other but what i find is those who really lean toward pantsing who don't think at all they tend not to have a central conflict because that's sort of the heart of their story and they come up with something else that's really cool like well, what if i had a main character who does this so well okay well what about that you know what's the 
the conflict that that character faces that what's the conflict that character has to overcome because that's really what your story is about so they tend to skip that and then you know they figure out oh you wait a minute i do need a central conflict you know on page eight or nine of their story and by that time it's too late right and you got to kind of then rewrite that first section or the other problem is they don't make it clear who the protagonist is who the main character is in their story because they have a whole cast of characters and their theory is well i want to introduce the whole cast to characters right but you want to spend more time focusing on your protagonist than you do on the other characters i mean think about like a, in a television show where they give you in sort of the opening intros that they have um every week explaining hey this is the name of our show and these are the characters in it right they always focus more on the two or three main characters and give them more screen time and their names are bigger on the screen and then the other ones who are minor characters in the story right get smaller names and less time on on that opening introduction same thing with your story you want to introduce your main character and give them the most time the most wordage if you will and make it clear that that's the main character of your story so those are probably the three biggest things that i see are you know backstory exposition and then not having a clear central conflict and then maybe not making clear who our main character is and instead introducing the cast of characters that's really helpful. There, there's a lot yeah. there that you had said that makes my mind go spinning like, yeah. okay, now I need to read the first 250 words of my current right. work in progress. Um, do you have right. any other helpful tools or books aside from the Storytelling 101 series? Yeah, I do. So for most of the last decade, I have the seven minutes a day series that I published. Um, and one deals with writing your bestseller and the next with going through the self-publishing process, the next with marketing. And then there's one just on the craft of writing, which is like 50 tips on the craftsmanship of writing. The idea was that you would read a little short lesson, like a page and a half, maybe two pages tops, and then spend seven minutes working and focusing on that and then from that you could build a story right and that but what i'm finding is that a lot of writers and uh, especially in when we get to the self-publishing and the marketing book need more detailed specific information than what i offered in those books so those are books are really great overviews if you just want an overview of the process but if you want to really dig into those first 250 words or dig into how do i design my cover or dig into how do i really do a book reading you know then you can go instead to the quick read series and get a longer you know ten thousand word instead of thousand words on it to explain it thank you so yeah. much for all of the wisdom yeah. and knowledge that you have given us i think that everything was so incredibly helpful but i do want to ask the one question i ask okay. everybody and is okay. what is one piece of advice you would give to a not yet published author to a not pu yet published author sure it's a marathon, not a sprint. So that would be my piece. I can go in depth about that if you want, but <laughs> but I think everybody knows what I mean. So, you know, if you want, everybody asks me, well, I want to be a writer. What do I do to be successful? You know, and, and well, what you should do, there's a formula you can follow. You should write a series of books, first of all. Um, it doesn't have to be like a trilogy, like Lord of the Rings, but it should be about a single character, like Ian Fleming wrote about James Bond, right? Or Janet Ivanovich wrote a, a mystery story in which we have the exact same woman solving the, the problems, um, a new mystery in each book, but each book is standalone, but it's a series. So you should write a series of at least three books. While you're doing that, you should develop your author's platform, which is creating a website, lots of social media, building your connections, setting up an email list uh, and putting together blogs or marketing, you know, and developing that sort of network of people who could potentially read your book or that you could promote your book to later on once you publish it. And then of course, once you publish it, then you do all that promotional activity and you uh, probably take out ads uh, on Amazon for your series or on Facebook. Amazon's probably better in my opinion, though Facebook used to be the place to do it. You, but you can see all this takes time because you're like, wait, you want me to write three books, um, three novels? That, 
could take me years to do. Well, yeah, it's a marathon. Or people say, well, you want me to get social media connections? It took me a year just to get, a, you know, a thousand people on my Twitter site. So, well, yeah, but in 10 years, you'll have 10,000 or 100,000. So, you know, plan on it being a marathon, put the time in and you know, it will happen. It will come together. There are people out there who make half a million dollars a year just self-publishing their books, but they're doing that and they've been doing it for 10 15 20 years now so that's it thank you so much for that that's yeah. great information anyway mm -hmm. rob thank you so much for being on here you Thanks have given me. us yeah. so much wisdom knowledge thank you again yeah absolutely thanks we'll see you